We were talking about modular inverses and we indicated how GCD of a number is related with the inverse. It's a tricky business, but we looked into the actual mechanics of how to find an inverse using something called an Euclidean algorithm. So what was it? A quick review of that. Suppose you want to find out, uh, you are looking at the set from 1 to 10. So all the integers from 1 to 10. And you have defined an operation between members of this set. And the operation, let's call it star. So how do you operate two elements of this set? What you do is you first do a normal multiplication and then you divide that product by 10 and look at the remainder. Whatever is the remainder, that is the result of your operation of those two numbers A and B. And the question was, is there for, for a particular number A, can we find something called A hat? Maybe we can call it A inverse. So can we find another number A hat such that A star A hat, whatever that operation is, is equal to one. That is the final remainder would be one. If we can find such an A hat, then A is the inverse of A hat. And A hat is the inverse of A and vice versa. So the question is, when does a particular number, when, it, when, when does it have an inverse? So we found that there is a way to actually find the inverse of a number given uh, the fact that if, if GCD of a and 10 is equal to 1, then A has an inverse. There are two very important points of this claim. The first one is the inverse is existing. So it's an existence question, whether such a number exists. And second is it's unique. So it's an uniqueness and existence theorem. Mathematicians are very interested in this kind of theorems. And they are very subtle in nature. They, they, they tend to be very hard many times. So uh, we demoed a couple of tools, a couple of examples of how to actually compute the inverse if we are not reliant on just trial and error method. So our example was this, that uh, let's let's do one one quickly so suppose let's take the number 15 that's our base number instead of 10 now we are considering the numbers from 1 to 15 and our operation would be the following that um, we want we will multiply so the numbers will be multiplied first and then uh, they will be divided by 15 whatever the remainder is, that would be the final result of the operation. That's how we will define the operation. Let's pick a number whose GCD with 15 is 1. So the G let's take the number 13. The number 13 is definitely its GCD or greatest common divisor with 15 is 1. Our claim is that 13 has an inverse. So there is another, uh, maybe I can go into the next board. There is another number, let's call it for the time being, let's call it 13 hat, such that if we combine 13 and 13 hat, we will get one. So if I multiply 13 with that, this 13 hat number and divide by 15, the remainder is one. The question is, how do we find such a 13 hat, such, such inverse? Generally, what we do is we just, if the sets are small, we do a trial and error. But if the sets are really large, a trial and error won't cut it. So this is the formal method of doing it. We showed it in the last video. This one is a quick uh, demo, a quicker demo. So what we will do is we will divide 15 
by 13. The only quotient is 1 and the remainder is 2. We will then divide 13 by this remainder 2 and the final remainder is 1. We want to show that the, so the claim final claim will be it always ends up in 1 if the GCD of 13 and 15 is equal to 1. So if the GCD was 1, this, we will, this process will always end up in 1. So once we have this 1, we will reverse the process. We'll sort of place the reverse gear and we will try to isolate 1. So now 1 is equal to 13 minus 2 times 6. And then we will replace this 2 by 15 minus 13 times 1. So 2 is this. So this is equal to 13 minus 15 minus 13 times 1 times 6. I just replace this 2 by this quantity. Okay, so this is 13 minus 15 times 6 plus 13 times 6. So this is 13 times 7 minus 15 times 6. That's what, that's what 1 is about. Uh, so let me just put it a little bit here. Maybe you can see it then. So 1 is 13 times 7 minus 15 times 6. That's what our that's the end product that we have so far. Okay, so what do we want? We want to multiply. So if 13 is if let's call 13 hat as x. If there is such a number, then 13x, if this is 13 hat, then 13x when divided by 15 will give remainder 1. Or 13x minus 1 will be divisible by 15. So 15 times some cube. Or third, or maybe I can write it here. 13x minus 15 cube would be equal to 1. So this is the final equation that we are interested in and see we actually found such a thing here 13 times 7 7 minus 15 times 6 is equal to this 1. So we found such a formula we could bring it to this form and therefore if we just read it off by matching it up we will see 7 is equal to x or the inverse of 13 turns out to be 7. And in fact, if you divide 13 times 7, which is 91 by 15, if you divide 91 by 15, then the remainder is definitely 1, which is nice. Now the question really was that, okay, we understand how this process works, but how do we know that this, it will always end up in 1? How do we know that such an inverse always exists? So this brings us to something called the Bezout's theorem, which is one of the most intricate theorems of elementary number theory. And here is a quick statement of it. So statement is the following, that if A and B are co-prime, that is if their GCD is one, then there exists then there exists x and y and one of them can be negative uh, numbers such that ax plus by is equal to 1. And remember this is exactly what we need. Why? Because remember in the previous board we talked about this that we wanted 13x minus 15 q to be equal to 1 right this is a common scenario this is exactly what we need so if i think about negative q as y 13 and 15 are my um, a and b so this is a this is b and negative q take it as y then we exactly have this scenario that a and b have gcd1 which is 13 and 15 have gcd1 we want to find out x and negative q or x and y says that ax plus by is equal to 1. 
And if we can do that, we can say, okay, X is the inverse of A. So that's how this particular statement directly gives you the inverse of A. Obviously your reference number is B. B or in this case 15. Okay, so now the question is, how do we prove the Bezos theorem? So to prove the Bezos theorem, you need something called well-ordering principle. And it is, a, it is almost a deceivingly simple principle uh, that number theorists often put to great use. And what is the well-ordering principle? It basically says that any set of non-negative numbers, roughly says any set of non-negative numbers has a, a, a minimum element. So non-negative integers. So maybe I have, let's say, 300, 29, 1, 53, and so on. There are plenty of non-negative integers, suppose there are. In that set, maybe millions and millions of non-negative integers are there. Then that particular set will have a minimum element. Now, this does not sound too much um, that uh, such a thing might happen. But if you look at even the rational numbers, this is not true. For example, if I take this set of rational numbers, so basically 1 over n, and if I keep on doing it, this set does not contain any minimum number because it doesn't contain 0, it is just 1 over n, 1 over n, and so on. It keeps on decreasing, but it never contains a minimum number. Its infimum is 0, infimum is a different idea. It's the largest number which is smaller than everything in the set, but there is no minimum number in this set of rationals. What well ordering principle says is this doesn't happen for integers, positive integers, and that's what we will use, we will put to use to prove that there exists such x and y such that ax plus by is equal to 1. So, why don't you think about it, give it a little try? And in the next video, we will uh, definitely talk about this. All the best.